Okay guys, we are talking about the pulmonology, the, the lecture today is about the forces on the lung systems. This is a lecture which is part of the lung mechanics. For this lecture, what we will do is this, we will look at the lung environment, where do the lungs live, what is the environment they do have and what are the forces exerted on the lungs by their environment. We will also see the inward or forces of the recoil we will see outward forces or the forces of the expansion. We will look at various pressure terms, for example, alveolar pressure, pleural pressure, transpulmonary pressure and so on. We will then look at the Laplace's law. We will do a couple of you know, questions as well that can use the Laplace's law and finally we will do some abnormalities, for example, atelectasis and the premature babies and why their lungs tend to collapse more than the adults. So that is the basic structure that we will be following. Today I have our guest cat with us as well. His name, if you can see, his name is Luffy. So today Luffy and I will be teaching together. Yes, Luffy? So what do you think, Luffy? Uh, are these the correct terms that we should be teaching? What do you think? Oh, you're, you're more interested in the lights? How about this? How, do you like these terms? You know, we're going to talk about the lung environment and the forces and units of uh, pressure and so on. What do you think? Okay, so Luffy looks like he's quite uh, more interested and fascinated by the lights up there compared to the lecture that we'll do. But Luffy, I can really use your, your help here as well. Okay. So with this, if we started our teaching the lung environment, so I'm going to let Luffy go. Cool. Thank you, Luffy, for coming over. Lung environment. So let's quickly draw lungs. So the lungs here that we are drawing for the physiology of the lungs will use one big alveolus present in the lung as a representative of, the, of all the alveoli. N remember that alveolus normally is about 100 micrometer in diameter. That is a normal alveolar diameter. In the smaller children or the premature babies, of course, this, this size is smaller. So keep this in mind because when we will talk about the uh, premature babies or when we will talk about atelectasis, this diameter is something or this radius is something that is going to reduce. Now outside the lungs, we have visceral layers, sorry, pleural layers. So we have visceral pleura, visceral pleura. This is a connective tissue membrane like structure that is connected firmly with the outer side of the lung tissue. You can almost think it is part of the lung tissue itself. Then we have parietal pleura that is a layer separated from the visceral pleura.
Okay, so this is parietal pleura. Parietal pleura or the outer pleural layer is adherent to the inner chest wall cavity. So if I make some ribs over here, then these ribs are attached to the parietal pleura. Right, so this is the environment. Lungs live in the chest cavity in the mediastinum. They are floating in there. They are not anchored. They are sitting in what is called the pleural cavity. This is the cavity, this cavity, pleural cavity. It is between the visceral and the parietal pleura. It is filled with fluid. It is filled, this cavity is filled with the pleural fluid. And here is the important thing, again, physiologically, this is the important thing. Luffy is back here and he is trying to participate. Luffy, Luffy, do you want to continue with the teaching? No? Okay. So look here. This, let me make a lymphatic channel here which represents all of the lymphatic drainage of the pleural cavity. So this fluid that is produced here is drained through lymphatics. Now, why is this important? Again, physiologically this is important because the drainage of the fluid from this pleural cavity will create a suction effect. What is that suction effect? It, it would try to stick the visceral and parietal pleura together. It is like if you take a balloon-like structure and suck from it and it would collapse and the two walls would try to stick with each other. That is the effect of lymphatics and it is an important effect to keep in mind when doing physiology. Okay, so this is the lungs environment. Of course, the heart is sitting over here. There should be a cardiac notch and stuff like that. In this structure, what we should now know from physiological point of view is that the rib cage or thoracic cage is adherent to the parietal pleura, which is now the thoracic cage tries to spring outwards. If we cut my thoracic cage right now, from my body and all the, the muscles of the abdomen and the muscle of the neck, you would see that it would spring out a little bit. So normally thoracic cage is kept in a semi sprung out structure by the abdominal uh, muscles and the neck muscles. Okay, and of course the thoracic muscles. So this is the environment. Now in this environment, what we have to understand is, okay, so now the lymphatics are creating the suction. This is the environment. Let's now see what are the forces on the lungs when they are present in this environment and how do these forces help in the inspiration and expiration or, or breathing. The, there are three stages to keep in mind. One is at rest. So let's say if I am at rest and not inhaling or exhaling like this. So I'm in a functional residual state if I have ex exhaled and stopped. Or if I have inhaled normal quiet breath and stopped, then I will be functional residual state plus tidal volume. We've done this lecture separately. So this is FRC, functional residual capacity plus the tidal volume. This is the kind of environment. So resting state, inspiration state, and expiration state. These are the three states to keep in mind when, when listening to this lecture. So now let's see what are the external forces. Look, to simplify this diagram and make that here, let's say this is the lungs. In this, in this lung structure, I have not made the outer structures yet the lung tissue and the alveoli, 
two forces try to collapse the lungs. So the inward forces, inward forces are two. These are called the forces of recoil and they are because of the lung tissue which is elastin and collagen. And what happens is that when the lung is in a resting state, these elastin and collagen fibers are sitting like this. They are kinky, they are contracted. But as the lungs expand, these fibers, when the lung would become bigger, of course, now you can imagine, imagine this a rubber band or a spring, this would now become, this would now become stretched. This also means to you that as the lungs expand, the recoil pressure or the tension to bring it back will actually increase. It is like if you pull a rubber band, the more you pull on it, uh, you don't break it, the more you pull on it, the more it would try to force backwards. So that is what's happening here. So elastin and collagen are responsible for the tissue of the lung to recoil. Then the inside the alveoli, and we'll do this greater discussion today, the inside the alveoli, there is fluid, fluid that is, that is wetting the surfaces that is making the surfaces moist or that is sticking. There is a membrane of fluid sticking to the surfaces. This fluid is making an interface with the air. This air fluid interface also causes a pressure inwards to try to collapse the alveoli. That is a tension. I'm putting T here. The surface tension inside the alveoli is contributed by the fluid that is lining it. Now, how does that happen? We'll discuss that. But these are the two inward recoil forces. Also, keep this in mind that the tissue is one and then the, uh, the fluid surface tension is the two. The second one, the lungs recoil is about one third of the total recoil. So lungs tissue, that is collagen and elastin, is one third of the total recoil and the fluid surface tension is about two third of the total recoil. That, that's an important thing to note. Now, what are the forces that are pulling it outwards? So of course we know that the rib cage, so if I make the rib cage like this for our study purpose, let's say this represents all the all the ribs and the ribs connected to the which pleura? Right, so they, they are connected to the parietal pleura and then they are pulling it outwards. So this elastic, sorry, this expansion or the force that is outwards is the rib cage, rib cage force. What is that doing? It is pulling the, the lungs outward. It is pushing them out while the lungs are trying to go in. So what will happen inside the pleural cavity? What is the pleural cavity? We had just discussed that. Pleural cavity is the cavity that is present between the parietal and visceral pleura. Now the fluid present there is being sucked out, but now it is being pulled out as well. So ultimately the pressure here in the pleural cavity is usually at rest about minus 5 millimeter of water, sorry, centimeter of water. Look, I'm not saying millimeter of mercury. It is centimeter of water. One centimeter of water pressure equals, so one, one centimeter H2O pressure equals 0 0.74 millimeter of mercury pressure, if you wanted to do the, the math. Or one millimeter of mercury pressure equals about 1.36 centimeter of water pressure. So that is the units and the conversion. Normally in the plural or pulmonology, we use the 
centimeter of water pressures. So here it is about minus 5 centimeter of water. Why is that? Look, there are two, take a balloon and pull it from two ends. One end is trying to move it out and the other one, the both are stretching it. And if from somehow inside it is trying to recoil, then the wall would experience a, a negative pressure. That is a negative pressure here. The lungs are trying to collapse, chest is trying to move out. The fluid here is feeling a suction on it and that is causing it to be sub-atmospheric pressure. All right. So, we have gotten the two forces as well. The discussion now we have to do is that this sub-atmospheric pressure, how is the recoil contributing to it and how do we use this pressure in Laplace's law. So, let us do that. So, before we go there, let us look at the terms that we are going to be handling. The terms are following. If I use This is an alveolus. This alveolus is in a lung. So, let us say this is the lung. So, this is the intrapleural or pleural cavity, pleural, pleural cavity with the pressure minus 5 millimeter. Sorry, I keep saying millimeter of mercury, I am so used to that, centimeter of water. Now, the pressure in here, see here I used T, that is the surface tension. Over here, I am going to use pressure P, so keep that in mind. Pressure P inside an alveolus, pressure P that is inside an alveolus at the resting state, where I have just exhaled normal tidal volume and I have stopped. So, that is the functional residual capacity, right, reserved volume and the, and the FRC. So, at that level, the pressure we say inside the alveolus is supposed to be 0 millimeter of mercury. Glottis is open. This pressure inside the alveolus is the same pressure as the outside. We call it 0 millimeter of water. 0 millimeter, centimeter of water. Today, I am stuck with the centimeters and millimeters. That is the pressure inside the alveolus. So, that pressure is called alveolar pressure. The pressure inside the pleural cavity is of course, called the pleural pressure. It is usually minus 5 when at rest. Now, the pressure difference between them. So, if I had, let us say here a graph, in this graph, if this was 0, this was minus 8, this was plus 8. On this graph, if I drew the alveolar pressure and I drew the pleural cavity pressure, then the difference between them is called transpulmonary pulmonary pressure. This is the pressure that is exerted. So, chest wall is pulling this, this cavity outwards. Then the cavity has a negative pressure which is pulling the lungs outward. Then the lungs pull outward ultimately causes the alveoli to be pulled open. So, this pressure that goes from here to here, the difference between that pressure is called the transpulmonary pressure. It is different from pleural pressure, it is different from alveolar pressure. Please remember that. It is the difference between them. For example, when the alveolar pressure at rest is 0 and the pleural pressure, let us say, is minus 5, then of course, the transpulmonary pressure is minus 5 centimeter of water. However, if I start inspiring, then what happens is that the chest opens up, the chest expands, that pulls the pleura, that causes the pressure to be translated inwards and the lungs are pulled open, that causes the alveoli to be pulled open. So, what happens is the alveolar pressure would reduce. Normally, it reduces to minus 1 centimeter of water. That is enough reduction in pressure or pull minus pressure 
that causes alveoli to open up. When they open up, they open up enough to allow 500 ml of air to go into the into the air airways. So, what would that mean? The pleural pressure when the lungs are pulled out, not the lungs, the pleural cavity when the chest expands, the pleural pressure normally drops to about minus minus 7.5 centimeter of water. So, it drops down from here, it drops down. As it drops down, the, the alveolar pressure drops as well, but that only drops by about 1. So, minus 1, minus 1 centimeter of water. So, see now what is the transpulmonary pressure? it is minus 7.5 and minus 1, subtract them it is minus 6.5. So, now the transpulmonary pressure is minus 6.5, although the pleural pressure is minus 7.5. Why am I clarifying this? Many times when students look at this in the beginning, here look at rest, the alveolar pressure is 0, pleural pressure is minus 5. If you take their difference that is also minus 5. So, many times students just simply say, well, that means pleural pressure and transpulmonary pressure is equal and the same thing. No, they are not. They are a difference between the alveolar and the pleural pressure. So, keep that in mind. Of course, we, to complete this story here, when we exhale, the chest compresses and recoils. When it recoils, the pressure from minus 7.5 in the pleura, when the chest recoils, it would go back to minus 5.0 centimeters of water that would allow the plur the alveolar pressure to go back to zero as well and so the the transpulmonary pressure would go back to minus 5 if i do a forced exhalation <gasps> then i would actually bring it down more lower let's say to minus or even positive let us say 1 centimeter of water that is the pleural pressure now and then similarly the pressure in the alveoli would go to some positive number as well. So, let us say plus 5 centimeter I am just making up numbers to make a concept here and so 4 centimeter of mercury difference that is the transpulmonary pressure. So, transpulmonary pressure is the pressure that is the difference of the alveolar and pleural pressure. Okay. So, now we understand the pressures as well. Let us now understand the concept of the recoil. Recoil forces are more important. What I will do is this way, talking about the recoil, first let us see this. If we take an alveolus that represents the whole all the alveoli of the lungs and if we fill this with pure water pure water alveolus is filled that means in this alveolus there is no air water interface what is that? Take a bubble. Look, here is a bubble, bubble of water. This bubble of water has an outer surface that makes an interface with air, right? It touches the air. The water molecules that live on the edge, they try to go inwards. They hate air and they try to go inwards. That is why bubble of water has this circular shape. This is the most optimal shape with the least surface area exposed towards the air. So, keep this in mind that water would like to get away from air. So, whenever you expose water to the air, it tries to recoil. Okay. So, here the alveolus is filled with water. There is no air. That means the lung that is here, the collapsing pressure in the lung is only because of its elastic tissue. 
that is elastin and collagen that elastic tissue would try to pull the lungs back from the chest cavity and make them smaller that is about one third of the total tension in the lungs recoil tension however pay attention to this however if you take this alveolus and if you fill it with air and just leave a pure water layer that is lining the alveolus so this is a pure water layer that is lining the alveolus rest is gotten air so now we've gotten an air fluid interface when the air fluid interface appears it's the same thing like this just in reverse then what happens is water is going to try to contract water is going to try to contract and pull the alveolus inwards that is the tension that is the tension created by the fluid interface fluid air interface so i'm going to make it t so now you're seeing two types of tensions one tension was because of the elastin and collagen present in the tissue and they are trying to contract and make the alveoli small other one is the tension of the fluid pure water normally causes about 80 dynes 80 dynes per centimeter tension tension equals 80 dynes however in the lungs the water or the lining of the of the airways are not pure water so what is that that has normal fluid and normal fluid in the in our case is going to be water some percentage then there is going to be proteins some pro really mostly ions sodiums potassiums calciums very very tiny amount of proteins some other substances so that is the normal fluid this normal fluid without surfactant exerts about 50 50 dynes per centimeter pressure inwards or tension i should not use the word pressure tension inwards so because this is not pure water that pull inward of due to the water air interface has reduced if now you put surfactant in it which is a separate lecture but let's just at least talk about it here what is the effect of surfactant if you take this this is the normal fluid of the lungs which means some water some ions and so on and then then you add surfactant in it surfactant molecules they get stuck they puncture the water surface and then they on top of the surface they they connect with each other and their tension that they develop at the air fluid interface this is the area that tension is normally about half or 10 times below so now they cause from 3 to 30 dynes from 3 to 30 dynes per centimeter that is the surfactant this is surfactant what is surfactant it's a separate lecture but over here this is the surface active substance that is released by pneumocytes too that are present in the alveoli as well about 10 percent of alveolar cells are pneumocytes type 2 sorry i should say type 2 type 2 pneumocytes about 10 percent of all the pneumocytes are type 2 they release surfactant inside the alveoli surfactant in turn in turn reduces the surface tension of the water and the fluid here enough that the surface tension goes down to 30 about 30 10 15 so way lower than if it was just the water so this is the effect of the fluids and the recoil generated by them of course this means that somehow we have to oppose this we don't want this tension to collapse these alveoli we have to oppose this what are the opposing forces we looked at it it is the expand expansive forces expand expensile forces of the chest cavity that are keeping it open okay however there will be a outcome of this as the 
as there is air inside here, that rhymes, as there is air inside here, imagine if it is a balloon, if you close the neck of this balloon and you exert tension from the balloon wall, what would happen? There will be pressure produced. So, the air present in here develops a pressure on it because alveoli are squeezing on it. That pressure is really important and we will talk about that in the Laplace's law today. So, what happens is the pressure that is generated inside because of the squeezing, that pressure, I will make that here, that pressure pushes outwards. It is natural, the, the air present in a balloon, is that pushing outwards or inwards? It is pushing outward. Who is pushing inwards? The, the wall of the balloon with the elasticity of it is pushing inwards. Balloon does not have the fluid layer. If there was an internal fluid layer, if you, may, if you put some small tiny amount of water and make the balloon all wet and then you inflate it, then there will be a fluid layer as well that would try to pull it inwards. So, this is the pressure that is trying to move outwards. This pressure and the recoiling forces and the expansile forces, they all have to become equal for the alveoli to stay stable. So, keep that in mind. Now, let us look at the Laplace's law. What does that mean? Laplace, Laplace's law says, It says that the pressure, this pressure generated is directly proportional to the tension in the wall, which we know that in case of alveoli, that tension is produced by two factors, the tissue, elastin and collagen fibers that are in the wall of the alveolus that are going to try to contract and collapse it. And second is the air fluid uh, medium interface that also allows the, the fluid to start contracting. So, tension divided by radius or it is equal to, if you remove the proportionality, 2t divided by r. So, now look at this, please look at this. What happens is, let us say you have gotten a larger alveolus and a smaller alveolus. In this large alveolus and small alveolus, what is given is that the tension is the same, the fluid that was present in them is the same. It does not have surfactant, it is just fluid present in there. So, T let us say is 2 and here T is also 2. However, radius here, let us say radius here is 1 and radius here is half or oh, let us do it differently. Let us make radius 2 here, radius 1 here. This is smaller. Now, let us cal calculate the P. So, P equals 2 T over R equals 2 T over 2 equals T. So, let us say T is 5 centimeter. Then here the pressure is equal to 5 as well. However, here, so they, they are in balance. Here, if we take P, 2 T over R equals 2 T over R is 1 here and if the tension is 2, then we have pressure of 10. So, there is a higher pressure in here. Is that significant? Yes. What is the significance of that pressure? There is an interesting situation. So, let us do this. Let us give it a tube and let us give this alveolus or balloon a tube as well. What which alveolus do you think has a higher pressure to allow the air to escape? This smaller alveolus has an increased pressure in it, which is trying to keep it open, but at the same time, because it is open, the, there is an airway present, it can actually escape too. So, smaller sized alveoli are unstable. This is what happen to the, happens to the premature babies. When they are born, not only this that they do not secrete enough surfactant, their alveolar sizes are also small. This is also what happens in atelectasis, which is a pathology where the alveoli are either closed or they are smaller in size, they are shrunken. 
and as the alveoli start collapsing, their radius starts becoming smaller, the pressure starts increasing in them, which allows the air to escape faster from them. So the smaller the, the radius, the faster the alveoli would become empty and that air that would exit would cause the radius to become even smaller. So if that cycle continues, the alveolus would collapse. So here, what would happen? So if these are the two alveoli, this is the normal radius, this is abnormally small radius, then this, this alveolus is going to try to eject, either the, the air goes to the other one or gets out and this becomes unstable and, and it can close. In the premature babies, there are two problems. One, their alveoli are smaller, so that means their pressure needs to be higher in the alveoli to keep them open, plus higher pressure means it's easier to collapse them. It is positive and negative both. So that is one problem. Second problem is they do not have surfactant or they do not have enough secretion of the surfactant depending upon when the baby is born. So it is about six, seventh month surfactant starts developing about, starts getting secreted from the pneumocyte to near seventh month. So early seventh month, after six months, there is a problem. And the, the baby would need aggressive help, otherwise he can develop the fatal respiratory syndromes and die. So the surfactant is also not present or less, both of those, so reduced surfactant means higher surface tension to collapse the, the alveolus. And smaller alveolar diameter means, means higher pressure to exit the, the air from it and to have difficulty filling it. It, it, is, it cuts both ways. So that is a problem with the, uh, with the premature babies. Now, one question here that needs to be answered and that is, what happens to us in normal cases when our alveoli become smaller and bigger? Why does this mechanism not kick in and kill the alveolus or collapse the alveolus that is becoming small? I will give you an example. Let us say, I am exhaling or then I am inhaling. What is happening at that time? Chest is recoiling, chest is going inwards or compressing. When the chest is compressing, of course, the lungs are shrinking as, as well under pressure. When the lungs are shrinking, alveoli are becoming smaller. When the alveoli are becoming smaller, this should happen. And if this happens, air should quickly eject from them and there should be a vicious cycle and alveolar should collapse. So every time I exhale and I do this, my lungs should collapse. Why does, why do that not happen? So of course, one reason for that not happening is that the chest does not just collapse fully. Even if I try to, my chest is not going to fully collapse, my, it stays in a particular density. So lungs are always pulled outward. So that is one force. Second force is, second mechanism is this, that inside the alveoli, I will make that here, inside an alveolus, which has normal surfactant concentration. So let us say this is the normal surfactant concentration and this alveolus is open with the normal diameter about 100 micrometers. When this alveolus becomes smaller, let us say like this, then notice what would happen. The surfactant that was dispersed is going to come near each other. So density of sur surfactant per centimeter has now increased. Increased density of sur surfactant would reduce tension as well. So this reduction in tension, so over here, what was happening? Smaller size, smaller radius was increasing the tension. What if the tension was reducing to because of the surfactant increased concentration, relatively increased concentration? So as soon as that happens, surfactant brings the tension down so much that the pressure also reduces. That is the magic. That is why in normal healthy individuals, during the ex exhalation, when the chest is being compressed, their alveoli do become smaller, but they do not collapse because of the relative increased concentration of surfactant, plus secondly, because of the normally active chest system or forces pulling the lungs out. That is why if you stab someone, then all of a sudden you destabilize those forces and now the lungs can collapse. Cool? So that is the lecture today. Thank you very much.